Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're going to do a fast and loose tonalist watercolor landscape painting utilizing sap green and Venetian red. The two tubes that I'm using are from Da Vinci brand, but you can use other brands. And um, if you don't have Venetian red, you could use light red oxide or maybe even burnt sienna. Uh, play around and experiment with it. So the approach is going to be saturating this paper, this quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140 pound. I don't know if I had said that. We're gonna saturate it with water and then we're gonna go back and forth with adding pigment in and lifting it back up. This is an approach used by the tonalist oil landscape painters where they'll thin the oil paints down with a thinning medium like just liquid or um, linseed oil, etc. Uh, two painters that currently use that approach, Stuart Davies and Dennis Sheehan, and they have tons of content. Well, Stuart Davies has tons of content on YouTube, so check them out. Okay, so usually with this approach, I just have fun and kind of make up a scene as we go along. But lately I've been painting, drawing, sketching this same scene over and over again. It's based on a photograph. I don't have it in front of me. I found it on Google. There's a place in the Chinese Great Wall, Great Wall of China, <clears throat> called Tiger Mountain. I think it's the beginning of the Great Wall. And being that it is the Lunar, lunar New Year, I've been playing around with uh, some tiger themed paintings. Um, one tea company that I buy from has been running a contest. So I was like, you know what, let me do some Chinese themed paintings and submit. Maybe I could win some free tea. Um, but I through that process, through playing around, I was playing around with um, drawing tigers, painting tigers, doing the landscape in the Chinese watercolors in ink. I even uh, did some pen and pencil sketches, which I really never do. But I felt like I learned so much just playing around with the different mediums. And I wanted to see how that carried over. So, with this scene, I had modified it to have kind of a wide bridge, a uh, great wall, like the top portion of it. So we kind of look down and then change our viewpoint to see the side. Then here we had a kind of watchtower. I gave the sides of the hill, the mountain, kind of a rounded look, which was kind of the Chinese style. Then I had pushed back horizontally up into the mountains. I need to get a new chair. This one is squeaking way too much. I've had this for four years. It came with a set for um, from Hobby Hobby Lobby, like a the art desk and the art chair. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the sky. Just started creating tonal values up there. And then we'll do distant mountain ranges. I think I'll do the mountain ranges um, after the dry off. Right now, just kind of creating the overall feel. Using the paper towel to lift. If there's something you don't like, you can come back in. I will say this. I wonder how the drying process is going to go today as I paint. We had a cold front come through and it was sub 30s last night and with the heater on I'm sure that's changing the humidity in the house so I'm gonna have a different drying rate I had left this region empty in the Chinese paintings but 
here will create a little bit of um, fields. I know I said I'd wait till it's a little bit drier. We'll do some mountains behind these. We're gonna come back with our field, start creating texture. I was using a mixture of uh, a burnt burnt upper or burnt sienna with a a yellow to create the stone effect, but uh, I'm gonna use just a limited palette here. Because that's kind of the goal. If you play with different mediums, they're gonna have different effects, different approaches. But you can learn from the different mediums and carry over concepts and see how they work in watercolor. Uh, case in point, this is the tonalist landscape oil painting approach, but in watercolor. So. Don't be um, hesitant to try different mediums. It might throw you off your game a little bit, but overall, I think there definitely is a positive growth factor there. The bad thing about this color combination in watercolor is that it does lighten up whenever we dry it. So we just have to be prepared for that. I'm lifting out textures of trees. Most likely I'm gonna add um, phthalo blue, phthalo blue, or um, ultramarine or Payne's gray as some darkening agents. Actually, let's do that now, just so you can start seeing that. Here's some ultramarine. If you're gonna add ultramarine in, Use it for the further back uh, mountains. And if you use Thalo Blue, use that to push things forward. Kind of um, one as a cooling and one as a warming. I put a good post up on um, Ron Ranson Disciples today. Uh, it's a Facebook page that I help moderate where we all paint in the fast and loose style. So if you like this style, there's different people that take this approach with the hate brush, uh, hate brush and they have different approaches as well using the same materials. Anyway, um, Facebook had shown me that what I had posted about three years ago. Uh, so I did a before and after post um, of about three years to get people, you know, kind of just involved and posting um, before and after for themselves. And doing so, seeing the progression that they have. At this point, you may realize that painting and art in general is just a lifelong learning experience. And be as easy and as difficult as you want it to be. And it can be as fun or as miserable as you want it to be. So keep those things in mind. You may not like the results that you're getting so far, but have fun in the learning process. That's one thing that um, I think is just really important. Just having fun while learning. That might sound like the school teacher in me coming out, but um, I will say this, sometimes it's hard to get students to the point of having fun while learning because um, behavioral issues. Taking the number four rigor, I mixed a little bit of ultramarine into this mix just trying to get a little darker concentration. This would be the, the tree line 
that's butting up against the uh, the wall. And we'll have tree the mountain side. I had talked about how we kind of went on an angle in the beginning. I'm starting to shape that out. And I might take a play from the Hudson River Valley painters of just creating the fields where the vertical distance between them get larger for perspective and we have larger tree elements as we get closer. Come back and build that up some more in a bit. Even back here. I have a lot of water on the brush, so uh, hopefully not get cauliflower effects, but if we do, it's okay. Of course, you're always welcome to follow along. You're more than welcome to sign your name. It's anything you do when you follow any one of these videos. And you have my express permission to sell anything you do when you follow one of my um, tutorials. I want you all to be successful and have fun and have money for art supplies. If you'd ever like to help support this channel, simply liking and subscribing, uh, commenting on posts, give me ideas what you'd all would like to see. That's very helpful. If you'd like to help out monetarily, I do have the Etsy stuff available down below. I also have a Patreon where you can donate very cheaply each month and that goes a long way. Special shout out to all my current patrons. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm able to use that money and experiment with different art supplies and bring stuff back um, onto the channel and have different things. So, there you go. Got the spiel out the way. Uh, my concern is just the white of the bridge. I know earlier I had expressed that I used um, a burnt sienna earth tone mixed with a yellow. I don't know the names of them because they're literally just numbered. Um, or if you buy a Chinese watercolor set, usually just numbered and there's not any names present. You have to be careful with Chinese watercolors with their um, light fastness and longevity. Some of them aren't up to standard. So, so far we kind of just used the three colors. We probably grabbed a little bit of thalo blue just because they're so close to each other on the palette and I didn't put any fresh paint out. But check in a moment. Maybe a raw sienna would help. I'm gonna grab that. So here's some raw sienna. All right, so we added about a fourth color here, just for the stones. I'm going to grab some Payne's Gray. Give some marks to that wall. Create that dark area. Tree effects on the hill. And texture. All right. 
Payne's Gray. All right, I think I want to do a dry off um, and do a second layer now. So I'm going to pause the camera and do a dry off. Watch for the drying shift that takes place. All right, we did have a slight drying shift take place. Um, that being said, we did mix in ultramarine blue and Payne's gray. And we have our raw sienna right there. Um, looking at it, those wet and wet mountains I think that we should leave them be. I do want to mix a background brown for some trees and work our way forward. So this is just um, ultramarine blue with the Venetian red. Of course, you can use the um, light red oxide. And what else? the sap green. If you don't have sap green, you can kind of mellow out phthalo green or viridian. I think with um, burnt umber, it kind of makes it more natural. So if you're struggling to find the colors or you don't have them, check those out. And Payne's gray is just a black uh, mixed with a blue. So if you don't have Payne's Gray, you can just substitute that in. Honestly, I just genuinely feel that color plays such a secondary role to everything else that we're doing, which for me is just texture, composition, marks, tonal value. Etc. Etc. Hake brush, building up our closer foliage. We might even bring some branches up and out. And we can go along back here, do the same thing we did on the other side with our field. Just as it gets closer, just making the, the lines bigger a larger vertical dis uh, distance between the lines. Just to give the illusion, the idea of that that's there. I'm gonna darken this kind of shadow wall just because we have a change in uh, direction here where we have the vertical of the wall, the inside of the wall then we have the horizontal of the walkway. So I just want a difference to take place between those two. Some texture. Let's go right to that edge there. using the card for a little texture, a little bit of scraping. I'm going horizontal since this is the, the top of the edge of the wall. I'm just kind of dotting in. We could do the same type of marks on the walkway. Internally, I'm debating if we should play around with uh, figures in the painting. We might. And what I was thinking, and I don't want to get sidetracked talking about this, but I think it's inevitable. Here, I have the edge of this 
watchtower. Which I'm thinking doing a steel yard composition where we're using the tonal value. I'm using the same tonal value here that's darker near the middle and it's being balanced out by the same value out here on a smaller object. And one of the New Year's resolutions was to go through and make videos on all the different types of compositions to help expand my vocabulary, my ability to self-critique, as well as expand my, um, my bag of tricks. So I'll get around to that. Just been producing a lot of different content and I hope you all are enjoying it. I uh, just having fun now. I think I had talked about maybe putting some sticks and twig texture over here. So we might do that. We do a dry off and take a look at the overall scene. Well, I'm very pleased with how this is coming out. The Raw Sienna really does work with this palette. So obviously um, you can use Raw Sienna with the Sap Green Venetian Red combination. So that's a positive right there. The background mountains, I'm very happy with how soft they are. I'm glad that this reads as a wall. It's a different comp uh, composition than I'm used to. The scraping of rocks in this fashion, I believe I had picked up from, who was it, uh, Stephen Cronin. So he has some different bridge paintings uh, utilizing that technique. Who else could we give shout outs to? I always like to talk about all the other painters that have been influential or played a role in my learning process. And to give you guys other resources to look into, we had talked about some branches and stuff coming over. I'm not gonna put a figure on this since we're staying in the tonalist style. A lot of people do seem to believe that uh, figures are often omitted from tonalist paintings. However, if you look at the paintings of Burge Harrison, who painted interior city scenes in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I bl believe he has people in them. It would look kind of awkward having an interior city without the presence of life, unless you were trying to make a artistic statement. But here, I don't think we would benefit. In Chinese brush painting, you often see a figure within the landscape, but um, I don't wanna carry that over into this one. Almost as if we're the viewer on one of the parapets or watchtowers, and we have this long expanse that we're watching. And something to think about. Whenever you read fantasy novels or watch fantasy movies, you know, they also often have the castle wall. They also often have a person standing there in the face of danger, in the face of um, the approaching enemy. And, uh, yeah, maybe that gives a feeling of that, that vastness, hopefully.
not as textured as I usually go with it. So if we ever do the scene again, and we should start, and when I say we, like, you know, in the videos, the royal we, should start adding different compositions and shapes. So that's, if anything, a benefit of this video. We'll do one last try off. Oh, we need to put something in the sky. If you have fields, you're gonna have birds flying over them looking for uh, stray rodents. Let's do our last try off. And there you have it. We dipped our toes in another medium for about a week and we came back to watercolor and brought a whole new uh, perspective. I hope you enjoyed and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.